negative declaration for Z18-04. Cindy. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for everyone who uh, is in attendance this evening. Um, so tonight, I just want to make it clear um, that we are reviewing the proposal in two phases. Tonight, we are looking at the ordinance and the environmental document. Um, if the ordinance and the environmental document is adopted, then the actual billboard application would come back to you um, at a later date. So a little background, the application was submitted initially in 2018. It was put on hold in 2019. In 2020, the city council had a meeting um, to determine whether or not the city would even consider this application. Then in, on March 15th, 2021, there was further discussion on whether the city council would consider this application. And um, we are here tonight based on this conversation. Uh, in August, the CEQA document, the mitigated negative declaration was circulated for 30 days. We also had a community meeting in October and then tonight's meeting was noticed via email, um, public uh, mail, and then also through the newspaper. Your staff report includes several policies um, in the general plan, I'm going to highlight two of those for you here tonight. Land use policy 4.11 regarding freeway signage directs the city to work with Caltrans. We did that. We reached out to Caltrans, provided them a copy of the ordinance and the CEQA document, and their response was to make sure that any billboards that come before the city receive a Caltrans permit. And that's included in the draft ordinance. Land use policy 8.7 regarding signs and billboards requires the location of signs and billboards to respect the surrounding context in order to minimize negative impacts on the visual environment. Furthermore, the city is to enforce sign regulations and design standards to reduce sign clutter and illegal signage along corridors. Um, just to clear up any confusion, this policy it is not telling the city that we can never change our sign regulations. That's why we're here tonight. We have an application to modify our sign ordinance. Um, the general plan is a, um, is a um, dynamic document and we, it's subject to change and the zoning ordinance is also subject to change. The municipal code has a process for amending the zoning ordinance. If uh, recommended for approval, your recommendation would be forwarded to the council for a decision. If denied, um, we are asking that you make explicit findings for your denial, and then the applicant has the opportunity to appeal that decision. So currently our zoning code prohibits off-site advertising signs, including billboards and signs that have uh, flashing lights and scrolling or moving text. We also have maximum heights along the freeway and regulations for the commercial district. Um, in order to approve the ordinance, there are a number of minutes, amendments that need to be made to our existing codes. Those are outlined in your resolution. I'm not gonna go through all of those here, but they include modifications for all districts regarding signs, signs in the commercial and industrial district, and then freeway oriented signs. Um, also before you is a proposed ordinance um, that would apply directly to electronic billboards and it requires a city agreement to, among other things, regulate offsite advertising criteria, content control standards, community service message provisions, community outreach requirements, maintenance standards, and conditions that trigger billboard removal. There's a permit process that an applicant will need to go through, including an electronic billboard permit that would come before the Planning Commission and the City Council, a sequent document related to that particular application, 
and, as I mentioned, a Caltrans commit. There are also findings for approval that must be made for each billboard application, and those are listed here. There are also conditions of approval that would be, uh, the sign would be subject to, including the agreement and the permits that I mentioned, um, making sure that there are not significant <coughs> impacts to public health and safety. That's usually uh, re reviewed through the CEQA process um, and some additional fine conditions here, including um, at least one compliance hearing to make sure the sign is in compliance with the ordinance. And then they would be subject to abatement hearings if they are found to be out of compliance. The ordinance proposes a maximum of two signs for the entire city. Those signs would need to be at least a mile and a half apart. The maximum height would be 75 feet. And they must be located in general services commercial or city gateway districts. They must be located within 660 feet of Highway 101 and at least 500 feet from any residential zone. The maximum display area is 672 square feet. That's on each side, that's an industry standard. The sign must have the City of Gilroy logo at the top. And there are various operational standards that would apply to any billboard that would be approved through a permit. And those are listed here. The operational standards include message standards, lighting standards, um, and brightness standards. As I mentioned, a CEQA document was uh, uh, created and circulated for review. The city hired a third party environmental consultant with direct experience in billboard analysis. Mitigations were prepared based on that initial study analysis. Those, um, the mitigated negative declaration was circulated for public comment. The consultant addressed those comments in the final mitigated negative declaration. And then there were amendments made to the mitigations based on those public comments. The initial study and mitigated negative declaration also analyzed the application for the billboard, including the billboard's height, size, brightness, and energy usage. However, even though we're not looking at the billboard tonight, the, or, the CEQA document does evaluate that billboard. But I want to say that approval of the CEQA document does not constitute approval of the proposed billboard. We received a, a number of public comments. Um, we also received letters from the applicant regarding billboard lighting, driver safety, um, a response to CEQA comments, and then benefits of the billboard. Um, as of 5.30 p.m., I received uh, letters from 34 individuals or organizations. Some of those individuals and organizations submitted multiple letters. Uh, the, there were three in support and 31 opposed. And some of the comments that we received are listed here. There are concerns regarding aesthetics, visual blight, astronomical pursuits, um, the billboard industry in general, driver safety, light pollution, energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, and then light impacts on wildlife and human circadian rhythm. Uh, many of these uh, comments that are related to CEQA were addressed in the mitigated negative declaration, and the consultant is here this evening if you have questions about the CEQA document. Uh, based on the analysis, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission recommend approval of the ordinance and the CEQA document, and the recommendation is here for your consideration. The resolution also includes the findings for approval. However, the Planning Commission can go against staff's recommendation and deny the application or recommend modifications to the ordinance for the conditions of approval. If the Planning Commission denies the application, we are asking the Commission to recite the specific reasons why you are denying the application. 
because we must put those reasons in a resolution of denial. If the denied, the applicant can appeal the decision to the city council who has final decision making authority. This concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions. The consultant is available for questions. The applicant is here this evening who can speak to you during public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Appreciate it. Uh, commissioners, the uh, floor is open for any questions for staff and the consultant. Um, I would take public comment, hold this public hearing because there are people that have come here. And if you, um, after that, if you want to make a motion to continue this item, you may. Um, but I think we should go and hold the public hearing because we do have people here and the staff and everybody needs to hear from the public. And then if you get a majority to want to continue the item, you would need to make a motion. Right. And we would uh, <clears throat> uh, include a date certain so we would not have to renote it. So will we do public comment first and then? Public comment first. Well, we want to hear from the applicant Absolutely. first and then public comment. And then the applicant can uh, has time at the end for rebuttal. Uh, Shelley, would it be appropriate for the commission to ask any questions of the consultant while she's here this evening? Yes, yeah. you can. We can go with the planning commissioner's questions first before public comment. She wanted to ask about the continuance. Okay. I, I actually have a question uh, oh. for the city attorney. In case if you want to deny that, how can we do that? You, if, pardon me, you want to do what? If we um, wanted to deny the application, because if you mention on the slide that one of our rights is to deny you still have to take public comment? Yeah, okay. And close the public hearing, and then you have to deliberate as a planning commission body. And as the slide said, the if the mitigated neg deck could still be approved tonight, even if you wanted to deny the, um, the zoning amendment, because you would have to find that there was something um, insufficient about the environmental document, which I don't think we have findings for that at this point. What about the zoning? The zoning already prohibits the billboard. That is that that I am, should be enough, right? As the staff uh, correctly commented, the general plan and the zoning is always subject to change. So it, this billboard will not be issued a permit unless the zoning is changed. So that's why the zoning amendment is in front of the planning commission because by state law, zoning goes to the planning commission and then goes to the council. Okay. So I recommend that we take, you ask your questions of the of staff and then we open, we give time to the applicant, then we give time to the public and then we give uh, rebuttal time for the applicant. We close the public hearing and then you can deliberate on either continuing this or making recommendations for approval or denial. Okay, thank you. And I believe the question about continuing is specifically to give our brand new commissioners an opportunity to get caught up. Yeah, you can bring that up during okay. the discussion. So I guess my question is, are we doing public comment? Because we seem to kind of go back and forth. It, it's open for commissioners to ask staff right now. Yeah, yeah it's commissioners asking staff questions, including the environmental consultant, and then we will open public comment, but we will start with the applicant first. Okay. I guess I'll go first. Um, <clears throat> are there any stipulated uh, or agreements that will be in place um, for say a, uh, a cost stipulation for say for example the the sign needs to be taken back down in 15 years 20 years I've done a lot of reading where cities have had to pay out of pocket to get reimbursed developers the fees to remove the sign uh, is this something that the city would look into as to stipulating a, a cost agreement limiting so, any exposure to the city? So currently the ordinance does not include, um, I forget the terminology um, for- uh, Amortization. Amortization. Um, does it have a, an amortization uh, section in it? We could add that. Um, I would 
definitely seek the advice of our city attorney um, if we were to do that. And then uh, the development agreement could also include some sort of provision. Um, but again, I would seek feedback from the city attorney. Uh, second question, I know there was a community meeting. Um, what was the depth of that meeting and what were the results? I, I have not seen any anything on that. There, uh, if I recall, there were about 10 people in attendance. Um, the, there, there wasn't, I, you know, honestly, I don't have my notes on that, but um, the, the comments generally repeated what we've seen in the emails, um, and I have those comments here. Um, aesthetic and visual blight, um, driver safety, light pollution, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other commissioners? I have a few questions just um, to kind of get caught up to speed. So I'm looking at this and it was, you know, 2018 and then it went before council 2019 and 2021. Um, can you, and, and I'm hoping that this is a quick answer so it doesn't have to be postponed, but can you provide me just a quick summary as to d had had this come before the planning commission prior as it is now um, you know what was what was the impetus you know in terms of what was brought to the council in the previous time so uh, the council did not uh, well first off I wasn't here when the initial application came in um, my understanding is that there were conversations between the city administrator at that time who's a different person than we have today and the council and it was decided that this application would not come before the planning commission and council. Um, I think, you know, rather than have the applicants spend a lot of time and money on environmental documents and all of that, if the council is not even going to consider changing the code, there's no sense in going through the process. Um, that was the decision that was made at that time. However, uh, in 20, let's see, 2021, we uh, went back to the council and asked if they were ready to consider this. Um, they, no decisions were made, um, but they said they were willing to consider the application, and that's uh, why we are here today. And the, the applicant is the sign company, not a car dealership, correct? No, so the applicant is actually the private property owner to the south of the auto dealership, and then the sign company, um, would sign the city agreement because they would be constructing and operating the sign. So there's basically three parties involved. And in the, I apologize for <laughs> all these questions. I'm just trying to get caught up a little bit. Please ask. Um, so in the, the document, there was um, stated some revenue generated, you know, 50,000 initially and then $15,000 per month. Would that then go? Yeah, do I need to find that? Oh, dear God. <laughs> and all those 500 pages? Can I respond to that? Yes. <coughs> uh, Andy Faber, city attorney. I'm here because I work primarily on this uh, ordinance with uh, city staff. Any financial terms would be worked out in a development agreement. That development agreement would have many terms to it, and it could include the kind of uh, term that Commissioner Bandol mentioned, for example, about... Uh, financial um, responsibility to remove the billboard potentially. Uh, it can include license license fees and other terms as well. Um, that hasn't been worked out yet. It will be, it, a draft will be prepared by law. It is also adopted by ordinance and that means it goes to you, the planning commission, to see the agreement for a recommendation. Then it goes to the council. So wh whatever terms are worked out between, essentially between staff and, and the sign company, Will ultimately come to you for for a recommendation and then to the council for approval. My, my question was mostly, wh who gets that money? Does the city get that money, the rent and the initial, or does the the property owner? Well, the, the, I think there are two things. The property owner presumably has some arrangement with the sign company, by which the sign company will erect the sign, pay rent, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a private business transaction that we're not involved in. Secondarily the um, city presumably will get some sort of license fee or other revenue from the owner of, either from 
the property owner or the billboard company, one or the other or both. Okay. So the city is expected to get revenue, but revenue that's not been agreed that. to okay. yet. I'm actually, I'm going to sit down because I'm injured and I... Is that yours? Oh. <laughs> So I also had questions um, uh, along with Commissioner Bandal about um, there was in the 2020 uh, city council meeting, there was concerns about a previous sign. Um, there's been concerns about signs in disrepair. Um, I understand from a previous uh, response that that would be co come later, but um, it seems to be that that is an ongoing issue, not only in the past year, um, but in other cities, um, our neighboring cities and across the United States. Uh, when I was looking at the mitigation statement, I believe it was, there was um, uh, information about NIT, and I had to look that up. I didn't know what that was. It's basically, I think I'm simplifying it, metric lumen, the metric version of lumens. Um, but I feel like it's very difficult to look at the um, expected impact when you're talking about one device and we don't know what that device is. The device is estimated to be 300 nits, which is the, a laptop screen, um, but those signs can have thousands and thousands of them um, in both directions as per the, the, the report. Um, and I know technology changes very fast, especially LED technology. So, you know, um, but there's no way to determine exactly the impact that this would have without understanding more about the signs uh, construction. I read the feedback, I listened to the, I wasn't part of the uh, community outreach, but there are ex experts, uh, um, in those fields that are giving feedback saying that this is disruptive. So um, I also had a concern about the uh, traffic, uh, risk to traffic, that that information I think was provided to the attorneys by the, um, the manufacturer, but there's also, uh, it seems to be very contentious it doesn't seem to be like there's any sort of neutral party on this sort of topic, and that's uh, not uncommon. But where one party says that it's not an impact, it's not destructive to driving, other experts say it is. And since these signs are designed to grab attention, then I think by default, all signs are a bit distracting. Commissioner, is there any question uh, for staff? Yes. Is is there any way we could get a more detailed um, understanding of the actual impacts? Because we can't get, I don't feel like well, there's enough information in this document to determine that. Testing, there we go. Thank you. Uh, so we are processing this application in two phases. Phase one is the ordinance and the CEQA document. Um, if an ordinance is adopted, that does not mean that the sign is approved. In fact, an ordinance could be adopted and no sign could ever be approved. Um, so that's why we're going through phase one. If an ordinance is not adopted, then no sign will be approved because there's no ordinance to allow that. So again, um, you would, if the ordinance is approved by the council, um, including the second reading, that the actual application would come back to you and you would have those details um, and then we would um, consider further evaluation through the CEQA document on the actual sign and then um, that sign could be approved or denied another sign application come in and that sign application would also have to go through a CEQA process and be evaluated for all the things that you mentioned. Thank you. 
Uh, I had another question. I noticed through the packet that currently, or the ordinance uh, that's being proposed says that there's only two signs that would be allowed. Um, is there a second site that has been determined or? No, so okay. we only have the, the one application, um, which is includes the application to change the ordinance. Uh, we do not have an application for a second sign. And the consultant hasn't uh, provided any possible other locations just during the survey period? So the consultant only reviewed the app, the ordinance language and the application for the sign uh, next to the Automa. Have we opened up for other competing bids, competitive bids for that sign? N no. Um, <coughs> I think Julie has something to say. Well, I think Mr. Faber might comment on this. This is not a... Uh, it's not really a competitive bid situation. We have an application for a sign. There could be another application for a different sign, for the second sign as well, which may well come in if the ordinance is passed. But but it's not as though the city is, is auctioning off a license to individual bidders or individual sign companies. I have a question um, about the, you know, competitiveness. Um, once, let's presumingly that we, we uh, approve, would the uh, the sign company then have any? Uh, uh, must they open it up, or can they actually contract with one particular company, and then it, it will be sort of a, a single option for for display, as opposed to because there, there was some confusion in the in the packet seems like as, as a as a plus point it was like this is going to be great for business in Gilroy for all sorts of events and and businesses etc cetera, etc cetera. but then there was a counterpoint that it that's not really legal that we can't really um, specify that we cannot uh, demand that that that's very much up to the sign company on who they're um, leasing that space out that's generally correct. Uh, there are requirements in the ordinance that would uh, require a certain amount of public service announcements, which which would be for the benefit of the city. But to uh, in a general, generally speaking, we cannot regulate the content of the messages displayed, other than provisions that they can't be um, obscene, they can't be you know terrorist messages, things like that. Uh, but in general, in terms of their general advertising. It's up to Gilroy businesses to make deals with the sign company, which I believe is part of the intent of the of the sign, of course. Right, but we can't specify. But we don't really have control over that aspect, no. I have a few more questions, if you don't mind. Um, in, in the packet, it made references to um, best practices from other cities, and then the cities that I noted were Milpitas, um, Roanert Park, and Rockland. Are those the cities whose best practices you were referring to? Yeah, we were. We reviewed a number of ordinances from other cities. Um, we also got input from the city attorneys okay. on uh, what would go into the ordinance. Then, um, did you happen to ask these cities how much, or you know, percentage-wise, for example, um, were local business advertisements versus like national advertisements as well as community service, community, um, what is it? Uh, I think it's community outreach, outreach. What kind of a percentages were, were used in those? Did you find that out from these cities? And then I have a, a piggyback on that too. Will small mom and pop businesses be able to afford to advertise on, on that billboard? Uh, we did talk to other cities primarily because they had uh, had relatively recent freeway signs put up kind of in relation to this because, as, as you may know, outdoor advertising in California has been contentious for decades. Uh, back in the days when there were just these static signs and you'd see the billboard painters go up there and hang the signs like wallpaper, you know. But that technology has obviously changed completely. We wanted to talk to cities that had experience with the sort of newer electronic signs in terms of the dis distribution of advertising and who, what percentages go, I think you should ask the applicant that. 
and I think the sign company should be able to tell you that. They would have uh, information on that. Uh, we, we don't have direct information, but they should. Thank you. Um, and then I, this might be another question for the sign company. Um, in the, the document, it, it made mention to, you know, the positive um, components to this would be Downtown Business Association, Chamber, Visit Gilroy, Gilroy Crossing, outlets, all of these things would have an opportunity to advertise. Have any of these organizations been contacted? Have any of these organizations shown an interest in advertising um, if this sign were approved? If so we did receive an email early on from a couple of folks who uh, were interested in, they said that they were interested in advertising on the sign. Um, I have not heard directly from the Downtown Business Association. Uh, they would have the same opportunity um, as anyone else to advertise. Um, they did not submit a comment letter on this application. So the, the ones that you have heard, are those local businesses? Uh, one was a local business, and I believe one was out of town. And then my last question is, um, would, and, and the concern I have around this is that um, there was something about having a Gilroy logo or, you know, some type of Gilroy sign. Would um, campaign, for example, campaign advertisements be allowed? Would that reflect possibly an endorsement of the city of Gilroy if our logo was attached to this sign and, and those types of advertisements were allowed? Well, the ordinance requires that the word City of Gilroy be prominently displayed, and that's intentional to be advertising for the city, in effect. But political advertising would not be, would not be allowed, and campaign statements or statements in favor of propositions or against them would not be allowed. Thank you. Commissioner, any more questions for staff? I see there are no more questions for staff. I'd like the applicant uh, to possibly come up so we can ask them questions. At this point. Uh, I, I, would it be, okay. It is open to public hearing. Just restating what you said. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, my name is Mike Conrado. I uh, own MC Properties, which is just south of the car dealers. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about it. I mean, I'm a businessman. I was, uh, so obviously a lot of people, and I've seen a lot of the negatives against this sign. So a lot of people are saying, well, you just want the sign because you're trying to make some money. Uh, obviously, as a businessman, that is. But let's take a look at the, the businesses I went around to, the car dealers. They've signed a letter. I don't know if you didn't see that. Uh, this sign has proved to be very beneficial to them. The, the sign company will be able to tell you that they got stats that shows they have a 10% increase. Uh, as a businessman, I also own the Old Orchard Supply, the motorcycle place in there, said they wanna use that. Uh, but also thinking in, in a business sense, if I was gonna open a restaurant in Gilroy, you, the nice thing about this sign, you don't have to have it like a billboard. In fact, this will probably take away some billboards. You'd be able to just advertise for a month, say you're opening a restaurant. You'd be able to advertise for a month and, and uh, not have to advertise all year. Or, or maybe you would just do it at certain times of the year. The city advantage that I think is very important, you got amber alerts that would be put on this. Like the other day when the freeway was closed, that would be put on this sign. May I suggest that maybe, first of all, there's a lot of signs already in a lot of cities. Most of the cities do have two. This sign, I, I thought you saw the pictures that it would be, it says, welcome to Gilroy. Uh, the sign basically, if you were to look at a truck trailer, it's about that size. Be enough that's changed every eight seconds. It gives a lot of flexibility. But I think uh, how it came about, by the way, was the car dealers actually came to came to came to me and and suggested we put it on my property because they didn't want to have if if the sign was on theirs, it wasn't going to be a third party. And they didn't how they split the cost. This is a very expensive sign. You're talking probably nine hundred thousand dollars. If they didn't work, people wouldn't put them up. Uh, is there any questions that you have that maybe I could answer? So you mentioned um, that a 10% increase in business. Is there a study that we can refer to? Yes, you get the, the sign uh, out front, which is the one that's actually putting up the sign. Arrow, which you people work with, is the sign company that builds it. But uh, 
out front could tell you that they've done studies by these signs, and, and like I said, all the, all the car dealers are looking, you know, they're looking forward to it. And, and you know, I completely support businesses in Gilroy and, and anything they can do. My, you know, I just am wondering if this is truly something that the small, somebody mentioned mom and pops, um, you know, we have car dealers, we have the outlets, you know, we have a few large businesses that would be able to afford these, but what about the small businesses in town? Would this be something that they would be able to do? And I'm sorry, Mr. Faber, is this the gentleman I need to ask or the sign person I need to ask about the... I think you can ask Mr. Conrado. He's probably going to defer to okay. the sign company. Well, there's there the certain things I can answer. In other words, you have a cost of this sign like in any advertisement. And, and like I said, if I had a restaurant, I, I wouldn't advertise. I, I don't know if he could afford to advertise all year, but I would surely advertise for a month, especially if I just opened up or if I had some special deals going. So to answer your question from a mom and pop, or, or like, let's say I used to own trucking. Most of you, you know, I was born and raised in this town. So I remember the town from 5,000 to almost 60,000 now. There's a lot of difference. Like right now, I still have a lot of people that rent from me down there. Everybody's looking for drivers. I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if I still had my trunk company. I'd have that. I'm looking for drivers. You know what I mean? I would advertise until I would fulfill that. It's, re it's really tough right now. On the other hand, you would, it's not something that I would do, like the car dealers would use it all year, I would think. They got deals. But the mom and pops are going to be, and that's the nice thing. You can't go in and, and get a, a regular billboard just for a month. You know, this gives you a lot of flexibility, you know. In the old days, we used to use the paper, the one ads. Well, it's not used anymore for a lot of this stuff, you know. Is there anything else I could answer? Um, I have a question, actually, for the sign company owner. Okay. Sure. Let me just introduce myself. I'm Jeff McEwen with Outfront Media. I've been with the company for 35 years. Uh, over the last 20 years, we've worked with 17 local cities throughout the Bay Area uh, and in development agreements with uh, new signage. Most and everybody is very happy uh, with the signs. They generate revenue for the city. Uh, they uh, public service messaging, which the city will have guaranteed space on. Um, Amber alerts are taken over by a third party. FBI most wanted emergency messaging that the city could use. Well, if we look at like last week when we had the floods here, we could have easily put up a quick note that 101 is closed. Here's the detour. That's how quick these can work. It's also important to know that there are 16 different spots sold, eight per side. Uh, so there's plenty of room for local advertisers. It's not, when it's not one face, one advertiser. It's eight on each face, up to eight. And so we're never really running at 100% occupancy. So there's always available space for the, the local uh, advertisers. And like Mike said, he's reached out to a lot of these local people. Uh, they're all interested. And they will be, have the first opportunity because – we, we, it really depends on the city. Like if you look at signs we have at the port, uh, Bay Bridge, those are usually high-end national advertisers. Uh, but we, we have Benicia, Fairfield, Cordelia, Martinez. They're mostly local advertisers on those signs. So there will be plenty of opportunities, and we have a complete sales staff that will be focused on this area to help out the local community. So to put it a sign up today yeah. will cost um, about 900 k A little bit more. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, today, when a sign uh, that big has to be removed, how much it would cost? We with would that account with all the the disposable fees and everything to do the full job? Well, today we've never had to remove a sign, but uh, we would be responsible for removal of the sign since we own the sign structure on Mike's property. But how much would it cost? Uh, we do it internally. It's not going to cost us a lot of money because we have our own laborers union that, that uh, their own staff that installs and removes. What's signs. not a lot of money for you? What would it cost us to remove a sign structure? Maybe yes. fifty thousand dollars. Am I understanding that you're saying that internally that you would that your company would pay for the cost of the removal, not Mr. Conrado? Absolutely. And a disposable. It's it's, it's out front media would own and operate the sign. It's, Mike's not paying for any of that. So and this, it, that a disposal is included? Again, I, I haven't been through that process of, of disposal, but actually a lot of it gets refurbished. The screens can be reused as another property. The screens are the most expensive part of the, the structure. 
um, and so those would be relocated and removed. And then it's just re, uh, cutting down the steel, which would also be reusable. So basically, your company will take care of the entire thing. Nothing would cost uh, would bring the city a cost no to sorry. remove. No cost to the city. And the other thing too, what average energy consumption does assign that use? I'm going to leave that up. We have a technical expert here, and also the CEQA consultant here. Okay. Answer that as well. Hi, my name is John Marciniak. I'm a representative of the sign company as well. Uh, I can answer some of the technical questions. The, the energy usage is between 40 and 48,000 kilowatt hours per year, which is about three and a half to four and a half single family homes. How, mu how much? Sorry, can you repeat that again? Yeah, it's um, 40 to 48,000 kilowatt hours per year, which is about 3.5 to four and a half single family homes. In a year, that's what three yeah, and a half single family homes use in a year. Yeah, I think a single family home uses on average about 11,000. So are hours. you saying these sign use that amount of energy per year and uh, the between 40 to 48 thousands of mm -hmm. kilowatts, you know, and then that's equivalent to 3.4 single family home it's, homes in it's a about year? Three and a half to four and a half. To four homes and a half per year. Yeah. homes in a year. It might be like 3.4 to 4.6. I, I can't remember the exact decibel or decimal. Yeah, that's actually not very much, though. Is that because it's LED? Yeah, LED technology is pretty efficient, and it, it's getting more efficient. Um, in the mitigated negative declaration that the city's consultant prepared, at that time when they asked us, it was 52,400 kilowatts per year, maybe 800. And since that time, it's we've been able to reduce the amount of energy use per year. I was going to ask about that because it's different in the report. Does that include cooling? So no cooling is necessary. The sign itself doesn't generate any heat. If it if it is generating heat, it's because the sun, just like with pavement, has heated it up, and then it, it offloads the heat. But it's it's not enough heat that it would be necessary to cool. It doesn't need, require any cooling. No. And in, if you have other technical questions about the sign, I'm happy to answer them. I just wanted to mention too that, you know, I can appreciate you all, uh, you know, we're an interested party. We want this sign to happen. The city has its own independent environmental consultant that knows this stuff as well, or maybe even more than I do. So, um, you know, feel free to ask me anything. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but you also have another independent resource at your disposal. So I have another question, and that is um, generally when I was talking about the um, visibility and, and light meters, mm -hmm. things like that, and I'm, I'm using, I understand RF, so I'll probably be using those terms because those are, that's my jargon. Okay. Um, what is the, like, is there always, will there be down tilt, it, it discuss down tilt of the and um, uh, beam pattern of the LEDs, sure. Uh, in the in the either it was either in the letter to the attorneys, um, or it was in the mitigated um, declaration. Can you give some more information on that, please? I'm concerned that there, even though we're saying 500 feet from residential areas, right there, it's just a little bit past 500 feet. There's a um, uh, mobile community. Mm -hmm. And there's also an apartment building and housing, and then housing up on the hill. So um, it mentioned that uh, light would be visible up to 85 feet. And the image of the sign is there, but it's blown up so big it's very hard to read. But it's in the text. I believe the sign height is 75, they, 75 feet. So... Traditionally, billboards were lit by just regular incandescent lights, and you would blast a vinyl face with with light bounce off. That's how it was seen. With LED technology, the the LEDs are directed 
at a specific audience, that being you know motorists on the highway. And they're not as um, visible if, if you're not in that targeted area. So the signs are angled 31 degrees downward. Um, now in terms of uh, lights and brightness, so the, there is talk about nits and foot candles, and, and I can appreciate that that's difficult to follow unless you're an engineer. Um, those are, so those are the scientific measurements for brightness. Nits are the, I, I like to use a, a, a baseball pitcher analogy. Nits are the, is the brightness that comes off a sword. So, you know, the nit off the surface of this is, is a certain value. And foot candles is like the catcher's nit. That, that's what's experienced. And so the, the nit of the sign are 300, is 300 nits, and then the foot candles at 250 feet, because remember, that's like the catcher's mitt. So at 250 feet, the catcher is, is getting it at 0.3 foot candles. And a foot candle is the brightness of light experienced at one foot from a candle. And so 0.3 is, you know, 30% of that. It's like if you put a dark filter over the candle. And, and what that means, because, you know, it can be confusing. You say, hey, I can see this sign from farther than 250 feet. Of course you can. Um, but w what that means is that if I'm standing 251 feet from the sign, it's not going to, you know, brighten the light on, on my jacket. It won't register on a light meter. So, so the light footprint, you know, what it brightens up around the sign is, is actually pretty small. Thank you. And um, how many candles per se, how many LEDs are normally on a sign of 14 by 48? So, I, I, I and and I know yeah. technology literally changes as we speak. Like when we leave this room, mm -hmm. it's going to be different. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I understand that it, it's one hundred and fifty thousand pixels about. But I, I want to set that in context because um, the number of pixels doesn't relate to brightness. For instance, if you go to you know Best Buy now and you get one of those o OLED displays, they'll have about two million pixels. And it's really more about screen resolution. Um, brightness is, is um, again, it, it, it's control. It's not the number of LEDs. It's it, it, it literally con it, it's controllable. And in here, the way that the the city is proposing to arrange its ordinance is that it would have controls on brightness, and and that would be, I believe, it's 0.3 foot candles at 250 feet. So. Regardless of the cap capabilities of the sign, there would be a regulator on it. And if the sign was exceeding that brightness, well, the city would have a right to bring an enforcement action. It would be a violation of the municipal code. So that's, that's how um, those relate. So pixels isn't really about brightness. It's about clarity and, and how the sign looks. And, you know, with billboards, uh, it, it just doesn't make sense to... to you know, use the same clarity as a, like an OLED TV, but those would have like 10 times more pixels than mm -hmm. a sign. So when it says per unit, what is the unit that we're measuring inside this document? Because um, I read that because it said um, uh, 300 nit per unit, and I read that as LED because it's an LED sign. Is that not what we're, how we're measuring it? Um, you know, I, I, I I think it, it's 300 nit per unit, but those don't, it's, those don't like aggregate. It's just um, like every, every little dot on, on that broadcast at 300 nit, and it's not going to change the foot candle. Okay. Um, it's like each little sign says 300 nit, and they're received, you know, those photons. And so it, it's not like it's 300 plus 300 plus 300. Altogether, the sign is broadcasting off the face 300 nit at any one point. And it would be received at um, 0.3 foot candle okay. at the catcher's mitt 250 feet away. So then, per unit, we're talking per sign. I guess I, I guess think, I'm I trying to get a definition of per <coughs> unit. Yeah, I, I, you can. Yeah, I think that's the appropriate way to think about that. Um, I'd have to look back at, at how okay. that phrasing is, but. 
Okay. The ordinance does not speak to NITS at all. That's something that they've introduced in their correspondence, which may or may not be confusing. It does speak to foot candles, and the point three foot candles at 250 feet is a requirement in the ordinance. Uh, it also, um, there's also a state statute that regulates brightness, which is also incorporated into the ordinance. So is that candle unit, how are we measuring that, per sign or per unit? Well, I, I don't know that we're measuring, but to the extent the, the I think, I believe, and perhaps Mr. Marciniak can explain it, it's, you, here's a sign, and if you're 250 feet away from the I, I understand the that sign. concept. I'm just okay. saying, like. Then what's the question? What, well, how are we defining unit? And since there's 500 pages in this, this right. is a lot to read um, in five days. Mm -hmm. And I actually couldn't, because we, we've got a new system, and it's great. I'm all for, for changing things up and making bring, bringing things new. But I wasn't able to actually access that page till Sunday. So I had sun, part of Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, you know, and only two working days to actually go through this packet. Um, so you'll forgive me when I have 500 plus pages plus the reviewing the 2040 plan that, you know, I'd have to reference back to exactly the ordinance page. It's a lot of cross-referencing. Okay. From, from the ordinance standpoint, there is a foot candle requirement, as uh, Mr. Marciniak mentioned. Presumably, if we had to, we could hire an expert who could put a meter 250 feet from the sign and actually measure it, I would think. Yeah, and, and, and we've done that. I mean, our signs don't register light after 250 feet. And so I think, you know, the question is, is, is it 300? It, it's 300 nits per LED, but it's also 300 nits per, per sign. Okay. Right? Um, you know, I'd like to yeah. say thank you. Is You've cleared up a lot. Also, I still have a lot of questions. <laughs> no, no, that's so fine. You. I mean, we're here to answer any questions you or the, or the public has. We appreciate a lot of this stuff. It's complicated. We also appreciate that um, people don't like signs and, and, and they have perceptions about them. They have been engineered now to not be as obtrusive as they were in the past. For instance, the light intensity that was used to illuminate um, traditional billboards where you're, you're blasting uh, incandescence off the sign. I mean, th those are 31 to 312 times the light intensity of an LED. So these signs are, are better. They don't have as much sky glow. Um, I can't remember the, the exact percentage. I think they have 60% less sky glow than, than traditional signs. Um, anyway, please ask me anything. I had a question about cost again. And would that be, uh, because it's digital, there is the opportunity to switch it out very often and change it throughout the year. Is there going to, will the cost fluctuate? And I would assume that probably is not part of the ordinance, but it'll probably be part of the contract. But I'm thinking about our local businesses, holiday times, trying to drive business, or with um, the sports rink coming in, um, if there is an event or something like that, um, would it be cost prohibitive for our local businesses to be uh, advertising at peak times when they should be advertising and drawing in business? I don't really think it will be because, you know, everybody's going to have an opportunity. We can sell day spots. We can sell weekend spots, uh, monthly. It, the usual buy from what most advertisers is four weeks time frame, but we have a lot of people who day part advertising so they can buy a spot for $100 if they want to run for two hours. So uh, but would it be time. variable based on events? So it's like, you know, like Coca-Cola with their with yeah. their machines and when the hotter it gets, the higher Coca-Cola costs. Uh, yeah. You know, so they're, they're able to uh, uh, change based on the weather. It also depends on, yeah, you could say special events, but also usually it's based on occupancy. I mean, if the sign is at 50% occupancy, we're selling really, really low spots just to fill up the space because it's empty space. There's, there's it's no revenue for the sign company or the city. So we have an obligation to try to generate revenue for both parties. But there's again, there's 16 different spots, lots of opportunity for all the local people. And again, that will be our uh, initial uh, focus will be the local business. 
just want to remind the commissioners that uh, uh, on our docket here is the MND and also the um, the ordinance change. I think a lot of the questions we're asking are specifically for the sign. I don't think we're at that point yet. So. Yeah, thank um, you. I was yeah. just about so just thank you, Chair. No problem. Any other questions? He says, is there any public comment uh, from the public? Any speakers? Well, Thank you. Quick, oh, yes. One other quick thing from a, a business standpoint, when they told me how much electricity that it was going to be, because I have to run electricity, I have shops that use more than that right now. They're the old style, like you were mentioning. So it's amazing on, on what they've done. The other comment I'd like to make is when uh, Cindy said you had about, what, 30-some people on a negative view, I noticed that, and I've read that, I noticed a lot of them are out of town. They just plain out don't want billboards or they don't want advertising. Uh, I don't know how many live in town, but you know, I know, like I said, I was born and raised here. When the town was small, everybody wants a, a nice little quaint small town, but we're not anymore. And, and this kind of stuff is new technology. You know, it'd be maybe a good suggestion to try talking to some of the other towns that have had them and, and uh, they've been up for quite a while. It's not like this new. So is there anything else I can answer for anybody? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have five public uh, comments. Uh, the first one would be Dr. Paul Lyman. Lyman. Thank you. Just want to remind the public you have three minutes. Good evening. Thank you for uh, hearing the public comments. I relish the opportunity to do some outreach to the Commission. Um, my name is Dr. Paul Lynham. I'm a resident astronomer at Lick Observatory. Uh, I've been working there for going on 12 years now. I've been an advocate and education astronomy for over 40 years. I want to thank Cindy and the uh, planning department also for doing a pretty thorough job. Um, and I'm going to refer you to a letter I submitted um, yesterday, but also to several letters of the Council over the preceding few years, which specifically mentioned the phenomenon of scattered light. Everything you've heard today has been talking about direct illumination. Light pollution is produced in the interests of astronomers by scattered light. The arguments in favour of LEDs, please give me an incandescent illuminated billboard every time, because it uses a single peak light source which only spreads out around certain wavelengths. The billboards, the LEDs that are contained in billboards, no matter what generation, they disproportionately pollute because they pollute in the blue part of the spectrum. Blue light is scattered by a power law to the order of power four. So you are constantly getting more and more scattered light. People have said that the observatory is not affected, that the statement in the MND says it will not contribute to light pollution. In my letter of yesterday, I cite scientific examples that demonstrate that metropolitan light is detectable between 200 and 300 kilometers from astronomical sites. Now, as this time has gone on, as I've become more involved in this process, of course, no observatory is going to endorse electronic billboards. You're no, you shouldn't be surprised. But what is a surprise and what is scary is that it's a public health issue. CEQA, this light pollution on environmental stuff, it's down for you to decide whether you value light pollution as an, or consider it an environmental phenomenon. CEQA allows you to ignore that. However, in one of the uh, misapprehensions I address in my letter, I'll quote to you from a medical study in 2016, light pollution is significantly correlated, correlated to all forms of cancer, including lung, breast, colorectal and prostate cancer. Immediate measures should be taken to reduce, not mitigate, reduce artificial light at night in the main cities around the world. The rate at which light pollution is increasing in metropolitan and conurbation areas is outpacing the rate of population growth. You are looking in a few decades' time at a public health crisis of hormonally induced cancers. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you, Doctor. Next, next public speaker would be Connie Rogers.
Good evening, commissioners. Um, I want to compliment you for asking really good questions and also compliment the consultant for answering many of them and, and explaining things. Um, perhaps some of the remarks that I had originally reply, uh, posted have, have been answered, but I want to ask you, um, tonight you're considering whether to allow something that's never happened in Gilroy before. This is really precedent setting, so it's to make a, a very big change in our existing sign ordinance. And have you ever seen these billboards yourself? Maybe you could ask for a continuation to have a field trip to look at the other ones that are close by. The only one that I've really seen was in Klamath Falls, Oregon, which is a little far for you to go. But um, it, it's hard to visualize what 30 feet by 22 and a half feet is. But I walked it off tonight before I entered the meeting. There are little convenient squares in the foyer out there. And it's 30 feet between those two entry doors. And then 22 feet high, I'm not sure, but about two thirds of that distance then. <laughs> so it's really huge. And the one I saw in Klamath Falls while I was eating dinner at an Applebee's was very bright, kept changing. You know, the colors were really vivid. It, it was distracting. Um, so I, I think the biggest question for you to think about is what image do you want Gilroy to have? Um, the technicalities are one thing, but the, you know, when you think about Gilroy, what do you like about it? And what do you not like? <laughs> um, please base your decision on what you want to see in Gilroy because many residents really do appreciate our beautiful rural location away from the bright lights and stress of an urban area. The website for Visit Gilroy shows scenic images of healthy outdoor activities, beautiful locations, wineries, golf courses, hiking, and farm stands. That approach has been very beneficial for Gilroy. Do you want to change it? <laughs> Um, so that, that's really the question. I do think there is a lot of public um, opposition. I'm not sure the revenue um, is worth the trade-off. And that is something when I asked Cindy about it earlier, she said no, they were not, the, the environmental document I'd was like not required. I'd like to let you know that your time is up, sorry. Not required to do the cost benefit study. So you don't have that information Thank except you. what the applicant we do have to move on. has told you. Uh, so I would pre ask you uh, to- Thank you, Connie, your, your, your time, time is, is up. up. Yeah. I would ask you to deny the mitigated negative declaration Thank because you. I don't agree with it. Thank you. <laughs> Next public comment, please. Next public comment, Jeff Kewen, McEwen. Oh. All right, uh, last public comment would be uh, Ron Kirschnick. Kirkish. That's good enough, thank you. <laughs> good evening, commissioners. You know, I wanna be fair. I, I think, you know, it's, only, it's right to be fair. You know, you, to, to use the wisdom of Sullivan when he had to make a choice over a baby. I can see both upsides and downsides on this issue. The downsides, I think, have been fairly mitigated. My concerns were, will this sign be used for advertising for strip clubs, for marijuana dispensaries, for uh, political advertisement, uh, for competition outside of our city, for our our outlets for our restaurants. And I think those answers were fairly mitigated. Not all of them, but those are important. We wanna make sure that we don't, these, these signs are an advantage for our community, not a disadvantage for our businesses. 
And that's something I think we still need to focus on. The upside is what the gentleman said. This can bring 10% revenue into it. You know, we, we, are, we sit at a strategic spot in this county. We, we have Highway 152 and 101. And they bring in a lot of traffic all the time. And if this sign is able to uh, bring uh, businesses or big customers to our businesses or our local businesses, then I think that's something we have to really seriously consider as a good thing. Uh, one of the things, one of the things that you know, I like to go to pea soup Anderson, and I do enjoy pea soup. And my wife is always concerned when I eat it, but uh, I do enjoy it. But what I, what I always have loved was the pea soup Anderson sign with sweet pea and the other pea. You know those characters. Well, the gentleman here said that uh, we're going to have on that sign an advertisement for the city. And I'm sure it's going to be a, a very nice design. It'll, it'll, it'll do good for our city. But I would like to actually see maybe a cartoon character of, a, of a, uh, that little wine guy at the uh, garlic festival. And that guy would be dancing around with his little glass of wine and a toga and like a cartoonish character. And I can see that being something that kids would love to see, much less adults driving in the car, that would attract people down to, in the future, uh, the, uh, the outlets, not the, only the outlets, but downtown through gourmet hours. So I kind of see, I'm, I, my time's up. So uh, you Thank get you. my gist. I think there are advantages that we should seriously consider too. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Kirkish. You see any more public comment or is that's it. Thank you. Very good. I'd like to uh, invite the uh, applicant or the consultant back up for rebuttal if they'd like to. All right. I will close the meeting for public comment. Uh, commissioners, any ex parte communication? Yes. I spoke with John Miller, and I just replied confirming that I received the emails from all emails that came in. Unless there was some later in the day, I worked, so if it came in later, I didn't have time. Apologize if you're here. Any other commissioners? No? All right. Discussion. Uh, before we start the discussion, I would like to um, uh, suggest that we move this out just to the next meeting in two weeks. Um, Staff has put together a hefty and detailed report. Um, it's over 500 pages. Um, specifically, you know, they're looking for um, for approval or denial, provide evidence. There was a lot to go through. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I did not download the, the, the report from December. And when I couldn't access this report, I went to the December report and it wasn't there. So I didn't get this until Sunday. Um, this is an average, for, for average reading, it's um, for comprehension, non-technical, it's 40 pages an hour. So we're looking at 13 hours of reading in, on the best case scenario, five days. So not counting the day we receive it and today. And we only had two days <coughs> of working hours to engage with staff. Um, this is a, we have had a lot of feedback from the community, pro and con. And um, we also have two new members. It's a lot to take in. They have, a, I, know they, I know they have a lot of training um, beforehand. Um, and so that is, it, it's been two years. What's two more weeks at that point? And then we can be properly prepared. Chair, I would, I would suggest that um, before we make a motion to continue this item, that the commissioners provide feedback to staff. So um, if there's any concerns, they'll be able to bring those, address those concerns by bringing it back, not just send it off without letting the, the staff know or the consult, environmental consultant or the applicant know what um, your concerns are. So we'll be better prepared if it does get continued, but I do, 
need to remind you that it needs a motion and it needs to be approved by a majority of, of course. the council. Of course, and, and I think Commissioner Ellie's main concern is uh, the lack of time she was able to study. So um, we'll go around and let every commissioner still uh, discuss, mm -hmm. and then we'll open for motion. So my understanding is there are two pieces. We're voting on two different motions. The Correct. first motion is um, the scientific piece of it. Yes, the mitigated neg negative, the mitigated negative, negative, negative yeah. document. And then my understanding of that is we must provide some type of a factual reason for negating that document. And then separate from that would be the zoning piece of it. Correct. My understanding is in order for this to open up for um, the opportunity for an applicant to apply for a sign like this, both of those need to pass. Is that correct? That is correct. And okay. then it goes to council for final approval. So I can completely appreciate, um, and I am fine either way with this, um, I am not a scientist, I'm not an engineer. You seem to certainly understand this document better than I did um, based on the questions that you posed. Uh, my concern is this could continue forever and ever and ever because they have an opportunity then to go back and come back with answers. And, you know, um, as I have seen the last couple of years, you know, there are several sides to science, it seems to be, anymore. And I'm just wondering if that would just continue and continue. I don't think, uh, that was one of my other questions and I forgot to ask. So I don't know if it's for everything. And this is something uh, Cindy educated me on with another issue is that I think, keep me honest, everybody, we only have 90 days for, once it comes to the Planning Commission, we only have 90 days to process it. If it doesn't get approved or if it doesn't get voted on in 90 days, it goes to the to the city council with mm -hmm. a default yes approved by, no. so it can go on and on, but I don't no, know that if they're is all not the accurate. That's not accurate. So, okay. Um, if you're trying to say that this would be. Or no, sorry, 45 days is what I meant, sorry. It's it's not a map um, <clears throat> and, and it's also, it's, not, it's legislative and it's not subject to the Permit Streamlining Act, but mm -hmm. even if it was, even that saying it was subject to PSA, um, that would not, the time periods for deemed approved or deemed, um, you know, deemed approved wouldn't run until the negative deck was also adopted. But again, this is a zoning, this is legislative and it's not subject to permit streamlining. So we're not under any time constraint. <coughs> Well, I wouldn't want it to go on and on. John? Mm. I, I took a couple days to read it, but um, I'm prepared to vote, but it's up to the, the rest of you how you feel about it. Thank you. Yeah. So sure. as far as a discussion of the commissioners, how do you want to go about it? So a Any know. type of discussion regarding the matters in uh, hand here. No, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah whichever way you want it, and I just don't want to jump, jump on top of it. So, you know, I had um, pretty much all the same concerns that uh, all our, our other commenters from the community, um, you know, impacts on wildlife, the visual blight, you know, that we probably don't <coughs> want a, a Vegas vibe to um, come in, yes, the whole aesthetics of it, why I can appreciate the opportunity to make money off, you know, but I, I'm not convinced um, that, that our local um, businesses, you know, since it's not guaranteed, it's really, you know, whoever com comes with the best um, deal for the, you know, as far as purchasing the time. And I can very easily see that there are international companies who have tons of marketing money can, can completely dominate that space. Um, and in, in, the, uh, in the packet, you know, the, all the concerns that were raised were basically, uh, mitigated by saying no, no that's not so but um, you know there were experts like the, the gentleman from the uh, observatory but also um, Sierra Club and the, the chapter of the Audubon uh, Society and really bringing you know their scientific knowledge and expertise to bear that yes indeed there is um, there are impacts um, 
And as far as the concern about driver safety, I have driven by a lot of those, uh, you know, there's south of, when you're coming um, from San Francisco airport going, going south, there are, are uh, these digital ones. And so, um, and also on, on 880 uh, southbound, uh, on, on the way back from Sacramento, there's, there's a, a, quite a number of them. And yes, they are distracting, and that's the whole point of it, right? They're supposed to attract attention. That's why they're up there. You're, you're trying to draw attention that, that uh, this is the product you're selling. So uh, to say that there is uh, um, no impact, I think, is just strikes me just like a, that's, that's ridiculous, right? Like if there was no impact, why would it be up there? Um, and our roads, especially 101, we have so many distracted drivers. There's just the horrible drivers to start with. So giving them an, an additional opportunity to be, um, um, I, I think is, is generally not a good idea. And um, I, think, I think also like regarding the community meeting outreach, uh, it was clear that the citizens, they opposed to that. So yeah. our people, our people, they, you know, they, they're not, you know, yeah, I, th they, I think it they was, don't like the, that. The community idea. Is, is definitely not in favor of. And of I, I think the, a, a good reason would be the the ordinance because it goes for now to this day the ordinance it prohibits that, right. so that could be a good reason. Right, because we've been never the, never had the opportunity to do that, and in my mind there was a reason for that, and and. The part that wasn't clear to me is that, you know, it says if, if we vote for denial that that we have to um, have have uh, evidential evidence that for, for why, and, and that doesn't make sense to me because the current state is it's prohibited. So if, it's to me that the, the onus is on the proponents to bring a good argument why we should undo that. Yeah. Not, I mean, if we were starting from scratch and, and we didn't have an, uh, um, or rule against it, or for it. Well, then, yeah, then we're we're, we're at uh, at zero, and then we can say, here's the good reasons for or against. But we're already in the in the state of it's not prohibited. I mean, it's it's not um, doable. So then the, the the arguments need to go why why we should do it, and and just for my my I, I just don't see that the the benefit of of one individual or one company to um, to make a profit will outweigh the uh, the negative consequences for the community as as very aptly outlined. So thanks for everybody on the um, in the community for submitting comments. I did listen in on the on the community meeting that we had uh, the, the online one, and there weren't that many people on there. Um, and I don't know whether that was just because of the way it was advertised, but it, it struck me as interesting that once now it is actually up for a um, a decision how many more people came forward and, and uh, voiced their opinion. And Commissioner, Commissioner, can I just say, um, actually the comments that you've been making are mm -hmm. the kind of comments that we're looking for. Uh, were you actually calling out reasons why you're recommending to Yeah, and I made the list so when we get to that point, so that, yeah. If, and you actually had them on the slide, so we, yeah. can, we can pull that up and, and, and literally like kind of go down and say, here's the, the five reasons that this commissioner is bringing. Uh, Manny, do you mind if I jump in? I want to make, right make it a discussion yes, rather go, than go like right ahead. each one of us. So on that note, um, uh, part of the Gilroy 2040 plan, um, goal LU8, is to support growth and development that preserves and strengthens the city's historic small town character and provides and maintains safe, livable, and affordable neighborhoods and creates beautiful spaces. So. Some of the things that we've heard from the community, which part of our position here is to represent, to hear the community and be the voice of the community, um, is our community gateways, part of which is identified as the US 101 interchanges to incorporate um, high quality site and architectural design, distinctive landscaping, public art, and other improvements that enhance the visual integrity of some areas. A lot of uh, the community indicated that this would not enhance those areas and that is LU82. Um, LU87 specifically signs and billboards um, to respect the surrounding context of the environment um, to ma minimize any negative impact on the visual environment. Um, <clears throat> and I know um, 
I think mentioned that that's not um, 101, that area is not a um, scenic route, correct? It is not. State defined scenic route, not a I, state defined scenic route. Yeah, yes, okay, thank you. But it is part of our, it, it is one of our gateways. Um, and then um, LU811 is about historic preservation and restoration. Uh, be honest, a bit of a stretch to, you know, we should always be accommodating new development um, as long as it, you know, fits into the aesthetics and appeal of our community. And then LU813, light limit, limit light pollution. Um, so it encourages measures to limit light pollution from outdoor sources and direct um, lighting downward and away from sensitive receptors. And I, I feel like, um, you know, this is, uh, may or may not have been written with the thought of electronic billboards in, uh, in mind, but I think it's important and applies here as well. Thank you. Commissioner. I don't really have much to add because I think everybody has either asked the same question or it's been addressed from the public comment, but I do think that it wouldn't be a bad idea to um, table this till the next meeting just so we have further opportunity, maybe go to one of those cities where those billboards are up and see them in person and to see, you know, is it distracting when we're driving by? Um, how does it look during the day or at night? Or, you know, how is that impacting um, their communities? Maybe reach out to a couple of cities where they've had them for a year or two and maybe get that feedback before we vote and make our decision. One last comment. Um, when I was reading through this, and this being my first meeting, I was stressed. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, right? I mean, this is hot. I'm, I was expecting um, both sides to be represented, strongly represented business as well as community. And based on um, the uh, emails that we received, the input from that, and based on the, the public comments other than perhaps um, those uh, that are um, directly tied to this and Mr. Kirkish, it seemed like there was more of an opposition. What I was really surprised about tonight was that there were no businesses here um, other than Mr. Conrado, and I, and I understand that the, the um, car dealerships are, have a vested interest in this perhaps, but there weren't any restaurants, there weren't any, um, no one from the outlets, uh, no, nobody from downtown business association, nobody from the chamber, nobody. I was just surprised by that. And to me, that lack of, um, that lack of voice does speak volumes to me. And I don't know if it's just that do dollars, advertising dollars are being redirected more through technology and things like that, I'm not sure. But um, that, that lack of voice to me spoke volumes. For the record, I'm stressed about this meeting. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, the floor is open for a motion. Uh, I would like to make a motion to table this to the next um, meeting, which would be, I guess, in two weeks, first week of February. Correct, February 2nd. Thank you. So you're making a motion to continue this item to a date certain, which would be February 2nd? I second the motion. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Alley? Yes. Commissioner Kushner? Yes. Commissioner Langer? Yes. Commissioner Lewis? No. Commissioner Montes? Yes. Commissioner Ramirez? No. Chair Bondal, no. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Four, three. I got it. Yep. <laughs> All right, four three. It is continued. Continued to the next regular planning commission hearing. 